So previously, we made this distinction between disconnections and functional group interconversions or functional group interchange reactions. And if you kind of think this through, you'll realize that functional group interconversion reactions and their corresponding transforms are not ideal from a synthetic point of view. In an ideal world, what we'd like to do is buy simple building block starting materials with all the functional groups of our target built in and just connect them through carbon-carbon bond forming reactions or disconnection transforms in the reverse direction for thinking retrosynthetically to build up the target just using uh, really complexifying reactions or simplifying transforms in the retrosynthetic direction. In practice, this isn't possible because we need functional groups to engage carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. And so functional group interconversion or FGI reactions end up being necessary to strategically activate or deactivate different types of reactivity. And we're really going to focus on this deactivation aspect in the remaining videos of this lesson, how we can turn the reactivity of a functional group off through a functional group interconversion process. But briefly, I wanted to talk about FGI reactions and their, their strategic use to activate substrates for particular types of reactivity, as this is a common use of FGI reactions as well. So as an example of activating reactivity, consider this transformation of an alcohol to an alkyl halide. An alcohol generally is not considered an electrophilic substrate or starting material at the carbon or R group connected to the hydroxyl group, right? Because the hydroxyl group is not a good leaving group. But if we need a nucleophile linked to the R group downstream, right? If our target, for example, contains that R group linked to a nucleophile, we need some way to activate the starting alcohol as an electrophile. In other words, turn the hydroxyl group into a good leaving group. And this is done through a functional group interchange or interconversion process. For example, using something like phosphorus tribromide, PBr3, to convert the OH group into a bromine, leaving us with an alkyl halide that now is a good electrophile at the R group, which can be treated with the nucleophile to lead us to the R nucleophile product. And so this functional group interchange process of converting the hydroxyl group, which is unreactive in nucleophilic substitutions, to a product that is reactive in nucleophilic substitutions is an example of activating reactivity. We're turning the alcohol into something that reacts in a way we want it to by changing one functional group to another. Occasionally, we don't want to turn on the reactivity of a group. We actually want to turn off the reactivity of a group in order to achieve selective reaction of a different functional group. And in those cases, we need to make use of FGI reactions to deactivate or turn off reactivity. So staying with the alcohol, one of the functional group compatibility issues with alcohols is that this hydrogen can be quite acidic in the presence of a large number of bases used, for example, to generate enolates or to do deprotonations at carbon relative to CH, OH tends to be acidic. And so the acidity of this proton can be a problem if we want to deprotonate elsewhere, for example, somewhere inside the, the R group. And so we're often motivated to turn off this reactivity and we can do that by converting the OH group into something different through, again, a functional group interchange process. And we'll talk about the specifics of this in a later video, but one way this can be accomplished is through the use of the formation of a silyl ether, a bond between silicon and oxygen ultimately is what's going on here. So we treat with a silyl chloride and base. What happens is more or less a nucleophilic substitution process at silicon. And what we end up with is R O S I R three, a silyl ether containing a silicon oxygen bond. And now we've replaced that H group with an SIR3 group, which is not acidic, of course. The great thing about this is that we can then treat this product with strong base. I'll just keep it general here, but this could be something like sodium amide, NaNH2, or lithium diisopropylamide, LDA. And the desired synthetic res result will be achieved without reaction of the hydroxyl group in the original starting material. So we can react something in R without worrying about that hydroxyl group being deprotonated. This idea of using functional group interconversion to achieve a deactivation 
of reactivity or turning off reactivity is more commonly called a protecting group strategy. We can think of that silo ether in the example we looked at here as a group that protects the hydroxyl in a sense. And the protecting group strategy really shines when we remove this silo ether, ether group and return it to a hydroxyl after we've accomplished our synthetic goal. So for example, we might convert R to some other group R prime and through a deprotection process, we can actually get back the hydroxyl group where we had run one originally. So the protecting group temporarily blocks or protects or masks the hydroxyl while we do chemistry that would be incompatible with the hydroxyl group and we can get that group back later through what's called deprotection. The remainder of the videos in this series focus on different functional groups that can be protected and deprotected and the synthetic conditions we use to achieve those steps. But thinking broadly again before we dive into the specifics, keep in mind that all of these processes from a retrosynthetic point of view are functional group interconversions, converting one functional group to another, doing some chemistry generally, and then converting the protected functional group back to the original functional group in a deprotection step. Protecting groups turn out to be very important in practical syntheses because in complex organic molecules with multiple functional groups, we often have multiple functional groups that can react under a given set of conditions. And we can use protecting groups to, in essence, block undesired reactions from taking place in those functional groups that we want to stay put. Another way of stating this is that protecting groups facilitate what's called chemoselectivity, the selective operation of a set of reaction conditions on a single functional group. There is a cost, however, and the cost is additional synthetic manipulations. We have to put the protecting group on and then take the protecting group off at a bare minimum. And that's at a minimum two additional synthetic steps with the corresponding energy use required, the time required, the solvent and other materials that end up wasted. Protecting groups are not exactly a green approach to organic synthesis, but they turn out to be very important. And so to make our discussion a little more concrete, I wanted to look at this example in which what we'd like to do synthetically is in essence, nucleophilic addition of a methyl group, this is a methyl group here, to this carbonyl carbon of the aldehyde in our starting material. And based on the apparent change that happens here, the structural change that happens, it becomes apparent that we can do this using some kind of methyl metal reagent, something like an organolithium or a Grignard reagent. The problem here, however, is that the hydroxyl group that is also present in our starting material, the hydroxyl group here, is incompatible with the carb anion, in essence, that's built into the Grignard reagent. And so, in fact, this is not what would happen in practice. We would not observe this Grignard-type addition reactivity to the carbonyl. Instead, what we would actually see would be deprotonation, and we would end up with a magnesium alkoxide with the um, aldehyde either completely untouched or it's reacted. However, it's only done so partially, right? So not all of our substrate would react in the desired manner. That's a problem, right? We're seeing a result that we don't want to see. So to get around this issue, we can make use of a protecting group. In a, and in fact, we can use the silyl ether protecting group that we saw previously, converting the hydroxyl group into a silyl ether. One example is trimethyl silyl or TMS removes the acidic hydroxyl proton and really leaves the aldehyde as the only electrophilic functional group left. We can then treat with our methyl Grignard conditions. And of course, we'll want to do aqueous acidic workup here to protonate the alkoxide oxygen. This will give us a product that is almost our target. All we have to do is remove the TMS group through deprotection and I won't worry about specific conditions for the time being here. I'll just write deprotect and then back here, protect. So two additional steps were required, the protection and deprotection steps. However, we were able to react the aldehyde chemoselectively. In the, in the Grignard addition step, only the aldehyde reacted. The silyl ether was unreacted. Protecting groups are very commonly used for this purpose to achieve selective reaction of a single functional group within a complex substrate. Protecting groups can even be used to distinguish between two identical functional groups 
located at different positions within a starting material. And I wanted to highlight an example of this because it really shows the power of the protecting group approach. So in this starting material, we have two hydroxyl groups. One of them ultimately needs to become a methyl ether, and that's the one highlighted in red over here. However, if we were to just hit this starting material with, say, base and methyl chloride or, or something like that, or methyl iodide, as is shown here, we would get a mixture of methyl ethers at this hydroxyl and this hydroxyl position. And so to get around that, we can make use of a protecting group approach, realizing that the bottom hydroxyl is a little bit more sterically available um, because of the smaller size of bromine relative to the aldehyde functional group. And so treatment with TBS chloride and a base only protects that bottom hydroxyl, leaving the top hydroxyl available for methyl ether formation. We can then remove the TBS protecting group and do other things with the oxygen highlighted in green. And so you can see it ultimately becomes part of a carbonyl group in the product where the um, methyl ether carbon eventually becomes part of an acetal. And way down the line at the final target, the red group is a carbonyl group and the green group a hydroxyl group. And so we were able to ultimately distinguish between those groups way back at this protection stage by selectively protecting the more sterically available or the less sterically hindered hydroxyl group.